I guess we can probably get started. I'm pleased to have everybody back for our virtual gauge theory. One of these days we'll be back for real live in person gauge theory, but for now, um, we're pleased to have Lynn uh, talk to us about homology concordance homomorphisms. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and thanks everyone for coming to listen. Uh, today I'll talk about joint work with Irving Dye, Jen Hom, and Matt Stoffergen on homology concordance and not floor homology. Um, so I'll begin by reviewing what the definition of not concordance is. Uh, first for knots in S3, we say that two knots are smoothly concordant if there exists a smoothly embedded cylinder uh, S1 times an interval into the four manifold S3 times an interval such that the boundary of the cylinder uh, is the union of uh, the two knots, K1, and the reverse of K2. Um, so here's a picture to visualize uh, the idea of not concordance, K1 is on one boundary component of S3 and K2 is on the other boundary component. Examples of concordant knots, well, if you have two knots in S3 that are isotopic, then they'll be concordant. Um, you can also have non-trivial knots, which are concordant to the unknot. And if you take any knot in S3 and you connect some with its mirror, uh, this will be a knot that's also concordant to the unknot. Uh, so we call knots that are concordant to the unknot slice knots. Um, and one reason why uh, people study not concordance is that it gives an equivalence relation on, on knots, which turn the set of knots in S3 into a group when you mod out by the equivalence relation given by concordance. So C here is the concordance group. It's an abelian group where the group operation is given by connect sum. And the identity for this group is given by the class of the unknot. And inverses are given by taking the reverse of the mirror of the knot. Um, so this group, the concordance group, is a very well-studied group. Um, and there are homomorphisms that can be defined using not floor homology or a Kavanov homology. Um, for example, the S invariant of Rasmussen and also the tau invariant um, give us lower bounds on the four ball genus of a knot and their concordance homomorphisms. Um, there's also many other concordance homomorphisms that um, have been defined uh, for knots in S3. But today uh, we'll focus on studying knots that are inside of integer homology spheres uh, that don't have to be S3, but they're um, living inside of three manifolds, which are uh, homology coordinate to S3. So this is a more general notion of not concordance and we call these uh, this notion homology concordance. So I'll take two knots, K1 and K2 inside of integer homology spheres, Y1 and Y2, and I'll say that they're homology concordant if, again, there exists some smoothly embedded cylinder, but inside of this four manifold, um, such that the boundary of the cylinder is the union of K1 and the reverse orientation of K2. 
And this four manifold here, um, before we required it to be S3 times an interval, but now it's uh, this compact four manifold, compact oriented four manifold, um, whose boundary is the two three manifolds Y1 and Y2. And the condition on homology is that the homologies of each of the boundary three manifolds induce isomorphisms on the homology of W. These conditions turn W into what's called a homology equilibrium. Um, so this notion of homology concordance exists for knots inside of three manifolds that are homology cobordant to each other. And we can again define a group. Uh, CZ hat here is the group given by, we take knots inside of integer homology spheres, which are homology cobordant to S3. And we mod out by this equivalence relation of homology concordance. And this again gives us an abelian group where the group operation is again given by a connect sum. of both the ambient three manifolds and also the knots. And the inverses are given by reversing orientation. Um, so uh, the goal for this talk is to study this homology concordance group, CZ hat. Uh, the first, there's a natural inclusion if we take knots in S3 um, up to homology concordance into this group. We have this natural inclusion map and a result of Adam Levine says that this map is not surjective. Um, so we can we can take the quotient of CZ hat by knots in S3, and we can study the quotient group. Um, so what is known about this quotient group? Um, first, uh, there's some results of Tom Levine Lidman, Lidman, who tell us that this quotient group is infinitely generated. Um, and this result uses the D invariance from Hager Fleur homology and also the reduced Hager Fleur homology of the, of the three manifolds. Um, they also give us that this quotient group contains a Z subgroup. Um, and they prove this by finding some, some knot inside of some homology sphere with epsilon equal to zero, but tau non-zero. Uh, which is a phenomenon that can never happen for knots inside of S3. Um, and more recently, Hugo Zhu showed us that the quotient group contains a Z infinity subgroup. Um, which leaves us the question of whether it contains a Z infinity summand. Um, so that's the result that I'll talk about today. There's an infinite rank summand of the quotient group of the homology concordance group um, modulo knots in S3. Um, so the way that we prove this result is by constructing a family of concordance, homology concordance homomorphisms. Um, so a family Vij, 
where i and j here are two natural numbers. Um, and we construct homomorphisms such that um, for any not in S3, if we evaluate phi i zero on the not, this agrees with the phi i invariance uh, from not flare homology that uh, appeared previously uh, in our uh, in a prior paper. And moreover, for J non-zero, and also the knot is in S3, the phi ij invariant will vanish. Um, thus, if we uh, take phi ij, we can define homomorphisms from the quotient group to the integers, the quotient group of homology concordance modulo knots in S3, where j is non-zero. So we have a family of uh, not only com homology concordance homomorphisms, but their homology concordance homomorphisms when you um, look at this quotient group of modding out by knots in S3. And moreover, we have, uh, if we take a whole family of these homomorphisms, phi n and minus ones from n equals one, to infinity, this will give us a family uh, of homomorphisms to Z infinity. And this we can show is surjective. Um, and so the surjective homomorphism to Z infinity gives us a, an infinite rank summand of the quotient group. Um, and what are some other applications of the phi ij homomorphisms? There is a relationship to the tau invariant of a knot. Uh, again, here the knot is inside of a homology three sphere, which is homology coordinate to S3. And the tau invariant is recovered by taking a sum over all ij of i minus j times phi ij. Um, so there's this uh, relationship with the tau invariant. Moreover, if tau is non-zero, but epsilon is zero, um, again, this phenomenon can never happen for knots inside of S3. So if it happens for this knot K, then this knot is not homology con concordant to any knot inside of S3. Um, moreover, we can obstruct a knot from being homology concordant to knots inside of a negative or a positive cipher fibered space. If there exists a J such that phi ij is bigger than zero, then the knot will not be homology concordant to any knot. in a negative C 
by your fiber space. And analogously, if you change the signs here, we get an obstruction to being homology concordant uh, to not inside of a positive cipher fiber space. Um, and we, we show that there do exist knots with this property. So there exist knots. not homology concordant to, um, well, any not inside of any cipher fiber space. Um, by finding some example of a knot where phi ij is positive for some j and negative for some other j. Um, so I wanted to talk about the idea of uh, how we construct the concordance, homology concordance homomorphisms, phi i, j. Um, first, uh, they build on the concordance uh, homomorphisms sorry. from... Before, before you continue, may I ask a quick question? In this corollary, are those knots very complicated? Are these knots very complicated? Um, um, I think they're uh, just connect sums of some mm -hmm. some knots. Um, so it's some family that looks like this. Um, and I think they're not that complicated. Um, maybe I'll say what they are towards the end. Okay. of the talk. Um, yeah, just, I think it's some torus knots and like surgeries and so on a torus knot plus one surgery. Okay, okay, thank you. Yep. Um, okay, so the idea of how we construct the phi ijs builds on how we construct the phi i homomorphisms for knots in S3. Um, so I'll, I'll take a knot in S3, and in order to construct the phi i homomorphisms, I take the knot floor complex, which um, is a module over this two variable polynomial ring. Um, and the knot floor complex was originally defined by Ashwat Sabo and Jake Rasmussen. And then given the knot floor complex, I can extract these phi i homomorphisms. Where the phi i is defined by first um, classifying all um, not like complexes over uh, some, some ring um, that appears naturally in not flare homology. And we will, uh, what we, we classify these not like complexes is up to the notion of local equivalence. Um, and I'll talk uh, some more um, in a bit about what the not like complexes uh, look like and what it means to be locally equivalent. Um, but first, uh, if I take a knot inside of an integer homology sphere, I can again take the knot floor complex over the two variable polynomial ring. And 
I can extract Fij invariance um, by working over over some some other ring X instead of over the ring R. Um, so up here, uh, the phi i's were defined by working with the not floor complex over this ring R. Um, this ring X I'll define um, for you now. Um, and it's going to be, again, some polynomial ring, but now we have some infinite number of variables. Um, U with the subscript B, W with subscripts B I, where I ranges over all integers, V, W T I. Okay, so some infinite number of variables with these relations. And the B and the T variables um, will multiply to zero. Um, so this ring uh, might look funny, but it comes uh, naturally as the pullback or limit of some diagram of rings that appear in not Fleur homology. Um, so X here is this ring, and it's naturally isomorphic to the tensor product of some, some rings RU and RV, mm. quotient by this product of U and, and V, where here RU is the polynomial ring where I take these variables with the Bs, And then RV is the polynomial ring where I have the variables with the Ts. Um, so this is the ring X that we'll work with to define the phi ij invariance. Um, so again, I want to first talk about the case of knots in S3, um, because the story will be analogous for knots inside of homology three spheres. It's just that the ring is, is different. So for knots in S3, again, we're working with this ring, two variables where uv equals zero. And we'll work with knot-like complexes, which are these um, finitely freely generated bigraded chain complexes over R. Um, and this, the properties of being a knot-like complex are motivated by the knot Fleur complex of a knot. Um, so the three properties that they should have are that if I take the homology of the complex uh, mod U, and I uh, quotient by the V torsion submodule. This will be a rank one FV module, and vice versa for U and V flipped. I should again get a rank one F of U module. And we also have some grading conditions on the chain complex. So for example, the differential has degree uh, minus one, minus one in the bi-grading 
the grading of the u variable is minus two zero the grading of the v variable should shift gradings by zero and minus two um, and we also want that this first isomorphism here is uh, respects one of the gradings um, And the second isomorphism here respects the, the other greeting. Um, and again, these conditions are motivated by the knot flora complex of any knot inside of S3. Um, so given, given a knot inside of S3, maybe it's knot flora complex could uh, look like some generators, uh, which are these blue dots and the differential maps um, have some coefficients inside of uh, the ring F U V, but then we can turn this into a complex over the ring R by just tensoring with R, and then we have this new complex. Um, here's another example. This is the left-handed trefoil knot. There's three generators A, B, C, um, and you see the differential maps. Um, there's two of them, and then the figure eight knot has a knot for complex over R, um, which has these five generators and these arrows that you see. So again, we wanted to um, classify knot-like complexes up to a local equivalence. And what does local equivalence mean? Um, I say that two knot like complexes are locally equivalent if there exists maps F and G, which uh, map between the complexes such that they induce isomorphisms on the homology of CI mod U mod the V torsion submodule. Um, so for each of, uh, each of these not like complexes, these homologies were just rank one FV modules, um, and F and G here should induce isomorphisms on, on FV. So for example, if I take the unknot, um, and the figure eight knot, um, I have their not flare complexes written here, the unknot is just one generator trivial differential. And here's the figure eight knot. And it turns out they're, they're locally equivalent because you can find these two maps F and G uh, between them that induce isomorphisms um, on, on FV, where you take the complex and you mod out by U and you mod out by the V torsion. And the reason why local equivalence is relevant to the study of not concordance is given by the theorem of Zemke and Hom that tell us that concordant knots in S3 have not flare complexes which are locally equivalent. So using um, not like complexes, we can study not like complexes up to local equivalence. And we can show that every not like complex is locally equivalent to a unique standard complex where a standard complex is of the form C um, with some parameters which are given by a finite sequence of integers. So Lynn? Just a quick question just about the, uh, <clears throat> I know this is not, this is all foundational, <laughs> we're all supposed to know it, but so is there some other, is there some, um, so it's surprising somehow that you have, I mean, the, the, the figure eight knot, of course, is not trivial in concordance. So is there something that would be, is this typical for um, knots that are torsion in concordance, that they're, that they're not detected by local equi equivalents? Um. Mm. 
Right. So let's see. Knots that are torsion in concordance will go to zero in under yeah. the homomorphisms. And but what about local equivalence, which um, um and I guess maybe the, re the related question, which maybe sort of you need the, the other one, is, is there is there some sort of, I don't know, slightly uh, is it coarser or finer <laughs> equivalence that would see that uh, on, on these chain complexes that would see that kind of torsion? Um, that, you yeah, know, that's a good question. Right I, don't, I don't know. Um, I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Okay, th thanks. Um, okay, yeah, so every not like complex, it turns out is locally equivalent to this, what's called a standard complex, which is parameterized by just a sequence of integers. For example, if I take this connect sum of these two knots, um, I have that it's locally equivalent to this standard complex. And what I mean by the standard complex is I have generators which are connected by differential maps given by alternating um, coefficients of u and v. And the powers of u or v are given by the, uh, the magnitude of that parameter. Um, so this, this theorem, this classification theorem, uh, allows us to, to study not like complexes by, by just working with a standard complex um, because every not like complex is locally equivalent to this uh, to a standard complex. And so we can define a family of homomorphisms to the integers by taking a not like complex, which is a standard complex and doing a signed count of the number of times that some integer appears in, in that sequence of parameters. So that's, that's how the phi j homomorphisms are defined. Phi j is a signed count of the number of times that j appears in the sequence of parameters where I'm only looking at the odd parameters um, in the standard complex for, for symmetry reasons. And the theorem that we prove is that for Vjs, they'll give us concordance homomorphisms from the concordance group to the integers. Um, so, Lynn, so there must be some, I mean, again, like Danny, this is a foundational question to which I, I'm sure I'm supposed to know the answer. But so there's some nice way of relating the um, you know, the if I take tensor product of two standard complexes, then it's a standard, it's equivalent to a standard complex where you know how those things, what appears there, right? And that must be the essence of the proof of that theorem. Is there a nice? Um, yeah, so uh, this theorem, you have to, right, show how standards, um, behave when you tensor two together. We don't have an exact formula for if you uh -huh. have two standards, what the what the formula should be for the new standard complex when you tensor them, but we're able to show that um, uh -huh. at least that the signed count behaves well. Um, okay. Yeah. But so, do it, so that's interesting that you don't know, uh, is it, I mean, how, how, how far off are you from knowing what the relationship is under tensor product? Um, I think we, we know it for some simple um, families of standard complexes, like, um, but the general formula, um, we, we don't have. Um, so I guess it's, um, Right. Yeah, we. Uh, I think there's a lot that um, could be done there. 
Um, so going back to this example here, the phi j invariants again are assigned count of the number of times that j appears in the odd parameters. Um, so here phi j will be one for j equals three, but zero for others. Um, so first I want to talk about why this strategy of working with not like complexes over R fails for knots that aren't in S3. Um, so why does it fail? Well, for knots inside of a three manifold or integer homology sphere, um, that there's, you can take the knot for a complex over R. Um, and Tensor with this ring, um, u u inverse. This will be isomorphic to f u u inverse with tensor with h f hat of the three manifold. Um, so, in in other words, we have that we have a direct sum of f u u inverse one for each copy of um, the rank of each of hat. So this direct sum in particular is just equal to one copy of UU inverse if the three manifold is S3, but in general, it's not, um, not necessarily equal to just one copy. And therefore, if we take the knot floor complex over R, for a general, not inside of a general homology sphere, it's not necessarily uh, not like complex, like how we defined it for knots inside of S3. Um, and the key fix for this issue um, is that instead of working over the ring R, we want to work over the ring X. Um, and if you take the complex over the ring X and you tensor with the analogous uh, ring, which is RU, with the homogeneous localization of RU, which is this ring, Um, this homology will be exactly one copy of that homogeneous localization. Um, so in other words, um, I have this uh, complex, which is a not like complex over the ring X. Um, where here, uh, CFKX uh, is the knot flare complex over this ring X, and it's defined by taking your knot flare complex and tensoring with the ring X, where X you can think of as a UV module via these actions of U and V. Um, and this motivates uh, in this property here that um, not floor complexes satisfy, um, motivates the definition of not like complexes over X, which is the analogous definition um, where we replace R with, with this ring X. So here, a not like complex over X is a chain complex over the ring X, which is freely finitely generated and bigraded with these grading conditions such that if I take the homology um, of the complex where 
I tensor with RU and I mod out by RU torsion, I get exactly one copy of RU. It's rank one as the RU module. And similarly for the RV module, um, where I mod out by RV torsion here. And similarly, I can define X local equivalence between X not like complexes to mean that there exists a pair of maps F and G between the two X not like complexes such that F and G induce isomorphisms on, um, on this homology here mod the RV torsion. So this rank one uh, module. And so all of the um, um, uh, I guess the definitions are analogous to what we saw before for knots in S3, but now it's just that they're defined over the ring X. And then we can analogously uh, prove the theorems that we had before about the classification of knot like complexes where every X not like complex is X locally equivalent to a unique standard complex, which again is parameterized by some sequence of finite sequence of parameters B i, where each B i now is not quite an integer, but it's a, it's a pair of integers. You can think of some pair of integers where the odd ones are representing coefficients of the U w's, okay. Um, so you can think of a pair of integers i and j that represents power of u b and power of w b zero. And the even parameters are representing powers of um, the homogeneous elements in the ring R v. So again, this theorem is a classification theorem of all X not like complexes up to X local equivalence. And it says that every such complex is equivalent to a unique standard complex parameterized by a sequence of parameters that represents powers of, um, or I guess homogeneous elements in the ring X. Um, so for um, the theorem before we had the phi i's were assigned count of um, parameters matching j, uh, we similarly can define assigned counts of the number of times a parameter matches ij. So we'll take a standard X not like complex and we'll define this signed count of the number of odd parameters matching IJ. And we have a homomorphism to the to the integers um, by doing this signed 
signs count of the number of times ij appears in the odd parameters sequence. Um, so as an example, um, this is the family of examples I mentioned earlier. Uh, MN is plus one surgery along torus knot, connect sum, the reverse orientation. Uh, so MN here is a family of homology three spheres, which are homology coordinate to S3. And knots inside of the MN, uh, we, we got by taking core of surgery um, in the first copy of this uh, surgery along the torus knot. And we'll just connect some with an unknot inside of the other copy of the sur surgery. Um, so this is the family um, I think Nikolai was asking about earlier for a family of knots that are not homology concordant to any knot inside of a cipher-fibered space. Um, so let's write down the knot flur complex um, up to local equivalence. Um, up to local equivalence, the knot flur complex looks like three generators. where the differentials are given by u to the n minus one, v to the n, u to the n, v to the n minus one. Um, um, but again, we, uh, we want to use our um, phi ij uh, invariance. We wanna compute the phi ij invariance for this family of examples, which means that we need to look at the complex over the ring x. So we can tensor this with X, um, our ring, and we get that the knot complex over X is locally equivalent to, um, well, after a change of basis, Again, we'll have three generators. Um, and the arrows between them will be given by V to the N W, the N minus one, and U to the N W to the N minus one. So going from here to here, we're tensoring with X and, and doing a change of basis uh, to get this complex. Um, so then this is in the form of a standard complex, um, a standard complex over X, and we can evaluate the phi ij invariance of this family of knots. So first phi n, n minus one. There's exactly um, one n, n minus one appearing in the standard complex. So this will be equal to one. And then um, everything else will be equal to zero. Um, and this is a the same family that um, Hugo Zhu computes for the Z infinity subgroup. Um, and it realizes 
of the infinity sum and of the quotient group CZ hat modulo knots in S3 um, by, by this computation. Um, and Hugo's computation um, of, I guess, these not complexes up to local equivalents um, comes from a mapping cone formula, um, a filtered mapping cone formula of Adam Levine and Matt Hedden. Um, okay, so I think that's that's all I had for the talk. Thanks for listening. Okay. Are there questions for me? Well, it is a cold day. Uh, leave it open for a little, but we can definitely thank Lynn. We'll be back in two weeks and we'll get warmed up with the sun. What's the next talk? Um, I need to invite somebody. <laughs> 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 like I said, we're getting warmed up. <laughs> Is there anything like this standard complex business in other parts of mathematics? I mean, like, not, you know. Maybe. I mean, it seems like I'm, you know, this idea of local equivalence and all, and uh, not like complex seems like a, a natural sort of thing that might have appeared somewhere else. I, any. Um, I don't have a good answer for that. Um, does anyone have any ideas? Yeah, I mean, I, I think actually uh, some, yeah, similar rings appeared before in, uh, uh, classically. And like, there's, there's a paper of Bourbon and Drozd where they classified the derived categories for certain uh, just affine varieties or very small affine varieties. Uh -huh. And Andros also has this notion of a tame ring, but th that's only for um, over infinite fields. But, I mean, you can make an analog of some of this stuff over infinite fields, and th then these will some of these will be tame rings. But I, I think actually people didn't really look at the monoidal structure on the derived category of the corresponding ring before, or at least uh, yeah, I don't know if we found it. Uh -huh. But yeah, the, the closest thing seems to be some work of uh, Drozd. And I mean, Matt, do you, do you know anything else about like the, just the question of understanding the tensor product of the standard guys? I mean, yeah, yeah, I don't think we know anything actually, <laughs> really. That seems deeply disturbing. Yeah, <laughs> but but aren't aren't those kind of? I mean, I'm I'm trying to remember you know talks I heard in, in my youth about you know, uh, in, in sort of representation, it's sort of on the borderline of representation and combinatorics where, you know, you had various, I don't know, symmetric groups or you know various things that you would think were very well understood, and then you'd say, well, okay, here's here's all the basic representations, and what's a theorem for decomposing a tensor product as a sum of irreducibles?
And it's, and you, again, you would think these are things that were worked out a long time ago and yet, you know, um, fancy people were, were, were writing long papers doing this. So I don't know, maybe there is some, I mean, I assume you've kind of dangled this in front of your favorite um, people in representation theory to say, you know, what does this look like something you know about? Because it feels like, I mean, there, there are lots of problems like this are harder than you might think, I, I think is the, is the bottom line. Yeah, I, I think I, I also should have mentioned that like the first instance it turns out surprisingly to be, uh, you know, the BGG or Bernstein, Gelfond and Gelfond classified the, the, the modules, not, not the derived category, but they classified modules over like the product of two valuation rings or something like that. But, and they even called them staircase algebras or something very suggestive of what this is. But yeah, they didn't calculate the tensor product rules even for the module. But it, yeah, it's sort of hilarious. It's from like 1960 and they just have a very short paper where they you know, classify all representations for product of DBRs. Uh, 